Welcome to Not Too Reads, an audio library of revolutionary texts. Chile, an attempt at historic compromise. The Real Story of the Allende Years by Jorge Palacios. The Chilean Armed Forces and Police. 4. Constitutionalist and Purely Professional Armed Forces. There is a serious mistake made by the analysts of the UP experience, such as Garces, the advisor of Allende, who suggested and still suggest that the coup d'etat in Chile took three years to come about because of a so called legalist, purely professional, and constitutionalist spirit of the armed forces, which had prevailed over the class interests upheld by the high commands. The truth is that until the victory of the popular unity, it was not such doctrinaire and moralist considerations that determined the behavior of the armed forces, but the fact that the constitution and the prevailing laws and institutions were fully serving the interests of the reactionary ruling classes of Chile and U.S. imperialism. The armed forces, therefore, were not legalist, constitutionalist, and professionalist because they were apolitical, but because such legality and institutionality were sufficient until that time to defend the ruling classes. If they supported the groups controlling the government, it was not because they respected these institutions and laws, and they respected them scrupulously, but on the contrary, they supported these laws and institutions to the extent that they served the big internal and external exploiters. It is precisely for this reason that their repressive professionalism made them the most effective instrument of oppression of the people, whereas they were content to carry out this task in a disciplined fashion without interfering in the rivalries between the various bourgeois circles contending for the government or the parliament. This was the case, of course, only as long as it was only the traditional bourgeois groups which were taking turn in managing the existing system of exploitation and oppression. In this repressive professional role, the Chilean armed forces have given excellent and abundant proof of their effectiveness and class orientation throughout the history of Chile. We have already given examples of their repressive activity, always against the people and in support of the exploiters, which show their true reactionary political position. As additional evidence of the fact that their loyalty is not some abstract legal or institutional precepts, as some suggest, there are various examples of the contempt of the high commands and officers of the armed forces toward the civilian politicians, the very managers of all this legality and institutionality of bourgeois democracy. With their professionalism, the commanders and officers of the armed forces saw themselves as better defenders of the capitalist order than these civilian politicians even though the latter were part of the legality and institutionality and were its official administrators. As it happens, when Allende was elected, legally and constitutionally, a serious incompatibility surfaced between the legalist and professionalist habits of the armed forces and the outright reactionary spirit of their high commands and the majority of their officers. The professionalism and legalism that they practiced had changed its label, and no longer served the usual reactionary interests. Allende, under the Marxist slogan of building socialism, was planning, and seriously began, to nationalize the means of production. Furthermore, he was planning to expropriate possessions of the United States, the main supplier of arms, credits, grants, and professional as well as ideological training for the armed forces. All this, besides, was, according to the U.S., threatening the balance of forces with the most powerful enemy of the Western Christian world, to which Chile belongs, the Soviet Union, represented in the government by the CEP. Finally, Allende was not suppressing the mobilization of the people with the same energy as his predecessors, and there was the serious danger of paramilitary popular leftist armed groups being formed those of the right were encouraged and supported by the U.S. themselves. <laughs>
it is easy to imagine the reaction of the high commands and officers of the armed forces in the face of all this. Since 1968, they were in the habit of sending all their military school graduates to the Panama Canal Zone for a two-month anti-guerrilla training course organized by the United States. According to U.S. sociologist Roy Hansen, in his study in 1964-65 sponsored by the Rand Corporation, the University of California and the Ford Foundation, three institutions closely linked with the CIA, the Chilean army sent 55% of its elite members to the United States for an average period of 14 months. Furthermore, the same study included a survey of 37 recently retired generals, and it was revealed that 73% of them had parents who were professionals, businessmen, and company directors. 81.6% of their best civilian friends were directors and professionals, 8.3% landlords, 2.8% politicians, and 2.8% businessmen. Employees and workers, 0%. Also, it is said that all four army men who reached the rank of general in 1964 came from the upper class. It is therefore perfectly natural that, despite their constitutionalist and professionalist habits, because they were loyal to their class position, they felt absolutely no obligation towards the Agenda government, despite all its efforts to win their sympathy. In fact, Agenda, during his rule, treated the armed forces in a way that they had never been treated by the previous governments, which, assured of the class loyalty of the armed forces, had left them poorly equipped with meager salaries and with no participation in the civilian institutions and enterprises of the state. It was precisely this neglect which served as a pretext for General Vio and his attempt to overthrow the Frey government by a coup d'etat in 1969. Allende, on the other hand, began by substantially improving the differential scale of salaries, particularly favoring the generals, whose salary went from 12 times the minimum wage in 1970 to 21 times in 1972, thus attaining a 75% improvement as compared with the workers' incomes. The budget of the Department of Defense was considerably increased. By the end of 1971, over 265 positions in the state economic apparatus were occupied by active military people. All the links of the armed forces with the United States were maintained. The training visits, the U.S. military mission in Chile, Operation Unitas, etc. Finally, on various occasions, Allende included high-ranking officers of the armed forces in his cabinet. Nevertheless, the class spirit of the high commands and officers of the armed forces was so solid that the government obtained very little influence by this move. All the estimates of President Agenda and his advisors concerning the ascendancy they thought they had were, until the end, absolutely wrong and subjective. Shortly before his death, Allende spoke of three traitors, even when the few supporters the popular unity had in the armed forces, basically in the troop and the recruitment contingent, had already been annihilated right in their barracks. Only very small groups were able to offer a certain resistance. The leader of the armed forces deceived Allende so skillfully that an individual like Colonel Washington Carrasco, one of those who escorted the Chancellor to Cuba in 1971 and who later became Commander-in-Chief of the 3rd Division, was considered a progressive. On the morning of September 11, he ordered the murder of 250 trade union leaders, workers, and peasants. Even General Torres de la Cruz, one of the most fanatical military fascists, was considered almost to the end by Allende and other UP leaders as an Allendist. We also know what Pinochet said to Allende on the very eve of the coup that he led. Quote, you can always count on my unconditional loyalty, Mr. President. Unquote. From the real events which took place in the armed forces, covered up by the campaign of praise directed at them by the government, and in particular by the CP leadership, in the vain hope of seducing them, the following emerges. The fact that the coup d'etat took three years to come about is due not to the constitutionalist spirit or still less to the democratic or even progressive spirit of the armed forces 
as some have suggested, but rather to the excessive number of putschist tendencies, whether of internal or external origin, which were fighting to have their say within the armed forces. These putschist tendencies, deriving from pressures from the US CIA and DIA, the National Party, the Christian Democratic Party, and the fascist group Patria y Libertad, as well as from the personal ambitions of certain militarists, endangered the unity and professionalism of the armed forces as a repressive force, as they weakened their esprit de corps. These tendencies naturally provoked many premature attempts at a coup d'etat, which endangered the effectiveness of the army. The need to discipline all these putschist tendencies, and to place them under a single high-level command, which would not threaten the unity of the army, and which would choose the most opportune moment, was one of the conditions which delayed the carrying out of the coup d'etat. If the Chilean constitutionalism and institutionalism played any role at all in delaying the coup, it was not because of the scruples of the military and their loyalty to these principles, but because of the difficulty of smashing at one blow the democratic guarantees and legal rights that had prevailed for decades in Chile. The presidence of General Prats as commander-in-chief of the armed forces was another factor which delayed the plans of the Puches, at least until such time as they could remove him from office. Prats was one of those extremely rare generals on whom President Allende and the CP leadership seemed to have a certain influence. It was a mere accident in the government's favor which brought him to his post, as he happened to be second in seniority to General Schneider, who was murdered during one of the first attempted coups. The highest-ranking army men, including apparently General Schneider, were demanding certain minimal conditions before involving themselves in a coup d'etat. One of these conditions was the destabilization of the agenda government by means of intensifying the economic crisis which would create a powerful movement of public opinion against the regime. They also demanded that the coup be led by the highest level hierarchy, and not by some two-bit adventurer, so as to preserve the unity of the armed forces, and thus be in a position to confront the risks entailed by brutal suppression of the long tradition of bourgeois democracy in Chile. This last demand meant, although not necessarily, the removal of Prats. The U.S. government, however, and Nixon in particular, paying no attention to the Chilean situation, carried on as if dealing with a country used to coup d'etat. In this manner, they created a serious situation within the armed forces by applying excessive pressures to provoke a military uprising before Allende took office. Nixon had personal reasons for acting in this fashion, which were brought to light by the comments of a high-ranking official of the White House, contained in the U.S. Senate's documents of inquiry on the ITT intervention in Chile. He stated, quote, This memo from the White House may give you some hint of the depth of the President's concern over the situation in Chile. In my view, Nixon believes that the Chilean situation can hurt his election chances in 1972 for many reasons, including the establishment of a Havana-Santiago communist axis. He thinks he would be blamed for the substantial advances the communists have made in the hemisphere under his administration, end quote. This tactical haste which Nixon superimposed onto the strategic decision of overthrowing Allende and the resulting desire to organize the coup between the time of Allende's election and his assumption of office created serious difficulties for the CIA and DIA. The CIA reported, quote, A military operation is impossible. The army is neither able nor willing to seize power. We are not in a position to provoke or to unleash a coup d'etat, end quote. But the orders given by Nixon during the meeting of September 15, 1970, were categorical. Richard Helms, director of the CIA, commented on this meeting, quote, I left the meeting with a distinct impression that we had been asked to do the impossible, and that it would be a tremendous task to get him to understand this, end quote. The head of the Group of Intervention in Chile, for his part, commented, quote, I had the feeling that the unforeseen was immense, that things would not work, and that we would burn ourselves if we allowed ourselves to be dragged into such an adventure. What chances did we have to successfully carry out a coup d'etat, or, at the least, to prevent Allende from becoming president, 
the chances were not even 1 in 10. I can assure you that the general sentiment of the people I was in contact with in the agency was, my God, why were we given this mission? End quote. Nevertheless, the White House pressures continued, practically forcing the CIA and DIA agents into adventure. As the President of the Republic, Frey did everything possible over the course of a few weeks to create the economic chaos which would provide the armed forces with their pretext. But, as we have seen, he himself stopped short of calling for a coup d'etat. While the opposition forces and the multinationals were actively sabotaging the economy, Frey's Minister of Finance, Andres Zalivar, told the radio and television networks on September 23 that, quote, the fear of an agenda electoral victory, end quote, had been enough to produce a severe economic crisis. His obvious intention was to sow panic and to aggravate the crisis. The panic generated by these declarations, combined with systematic sabotage, provoked the withdrawal of some 600 million escudos, about $50 million, from the state bank, 54 million escudos from the savings deposits, some 11 million from the readjustable savings funds, and some 322 million from the savings and mortgage accounts. Thus, the state bank was forced to remit $80 million to the private banks, one-fifth of its total currency reserves, so as to cope with the money rush of their depositors. Meanwhile, the refusal of the large national and foreign enterprises to sell on credit to the smaller and medium-sized enterprises and the commercial sector seriously harmed the latter's economic activity. However, the short period available to cause economic catastrophe and satisfy Nixon's haste, as well as the failure to deceive public opinion by casting all the blame on Agende, who had not even taken office yet, resulted in the impossibility of creating a significant mass movement in support of the Putschists. Faced with this situation, Schneider, commander-in-chief of the armed forces, demanded at least a legal pretext to unleash the coup. He himself suggested such a pretext when he declared that he would respect, quote, the verdict of the polls or of the National Congress, end quote. The problem, therefore, became to get the Parliament to reject Agende's nomination. If this gave rise to disorders, all the better. The armed forces would crush them, defending the legal prerogative of the Parliament to name whichever candidate had received the most votes. But Frey did not succeed in involving his party in this maneuver, and everyone knew in advance that the Congress would appoint Agende. In these circumstances, the CIA and the DIA still subject to the imperative pressures of their government, had to lend their support to the adventurers within the armed forces, who were offering to kidnap Schneider. In this manner, they killed two birds with one stone. They neutralized the man who was hesitating to launch a coup without a legal pretext, and they accused the left of having kidnapped him with the aim of inciting an armed uprising. Consequently, they did not hesitate to try to divide the armed forces. In a telegram dated September 23, 1970, the Santiago station of the CIA reported to its headquarters, quote, We have good reasons to believe that neither Frey nor Schneider will take action in the present conditions. Every scenario in which one or the other might play some active role seems for the present to be totally unrealistic. They might, of course, try some adventures in the direction of the lower-ranking officers, Valenzuela, for example. This means that we will have to provoke a split within the armed forces, end quote. On October 6, after various people had been sounded out, a telegram from the Santiago station reached the CIA headquarters. It said that Vio, the general who had been retired after an unsuccessful Putschist attempt in 1969, quote, was ready to unleash a coup d'etat on the evening of October 9 or the morning of October 10, end quote. Moreover, the CIA, according to the Senate report on its activities in Chile, quote, knew that the plans of all groups of plotters began with the abduction of the constitutionalist commander-in-chief of the Chilean armed forces, René Schneider, end quote. Quote, it quickly became obvious to both White House and CIA representatives 
that a military coup was the only way to prevent Allende's accession to power, end quote. That is, the only way to meet Nixon's categorical demands. Quote, to achieve this end, end quote, the report added, quote, the CIA established contact with several groups of military plotters and provided weapons and tear gas to one group, end quote. Some contacts had been made which led to a kind of pact between the group headed by Vio and the one led by Camilo Valenzuela, commander of the Santiago garrison, who distrusted Vio's real contacts. The Santiago station of the CIA, however, continued to send reports which were pessimistic about Nixon's obstinate decisions. The headquarters was even forced to draw their attention to the fact that, quote, reports should not engage in analysis and arguments, but should be confined to reporting on actions undertaken, end quote. On October 8, the CIA's intervention group in Chile had reported, quote, At the highest level, the armed forces are incapable of coming to an agreement to block Allende, end quote. According to the deposition of Karamessines before the U.S. Senate, meetings were held between October 10 and October 22, and, quote, the president made remarkable efforts to convince all the people present of the absolute necessity to thwart Allende's election to the presidency, end quote. On October 10, a telegram reached Santiago from the headquarters, quote, We want to encourage Vio and improve his plans for a coup d'etat. Try to influence him, end quote. The issue was thus to encourage him, but at the same time, to prevent him from launching some adventure. The encouragement for this honorable general of the republic consisted of $20,000 and a life insurance of $250,000 for his partners. On October 15, two Chilean generals made one last attempt to convince Schneider to join the coup d'etat. He refused. Undoubtedly, this refusal cannot be attributed to Schneider's constitutionalist spirit, as it has repeatedly been suggested, for, in this case, he would have taken action against the Putschists. Furthermore, Schneider was one of those militarists closely linked with the United States. In fact, it was he who had authorized Roy Hansen to investigate the Chilean armed forces, even giving him access to documents of the general staff, which were forbidden to Chilean civilians. All this, however, did not mean that he, any more than Frey, was ready to follow Nixon's whims and embark on a dangerous adventure, a battle involving a high risk of defeat. The proof that Schneider's attitude was at the very least reasonable is that the U.S. government itself and the CIA Central changed their mind, even though too late, and tried, at least according to what they say, to restrain Vio until his plans were improved. The CIA Central finished by describing Vio's attempts as, quote, having very little chances of success and likely to damage any subsequent and more serious action, end quote. On October 15, Kissinger met in the White House with his assistant general, Alexander Haig, later to become commander of the NATO forces, and Thomas Karamessines, chief of the CIA's secret services. Nixon was apparently absent. From this meeting, a telegram was sent to the Santiago station of the CIA for General Vio. It said, quote, We have studied your plan. Based on your information and our own, we have concluded that your plan for a coup d'etat cannot succeed for the time being. If you fail, it may reduce the chances of success in the future. Keep your cards in your hand. We will keep in touch. The time will come when you and your friends can do something. You still have our support, end quote. The decision to postpone Vio's coup was transmitted on October 17 to one of his partners, who replied that what he was being told was of little importance, since it had been decided to proceed with the coup d'etat no matter what happened. The result of Vio's adventure is well known. Schneider was murdered during the kidnapping, and the civilian commandos who took part in the action were so clumsy that they were caught a few days later. The whole story of this abortive attempt clearly illustrates the two basic reasons which we have pointed out as the cause of the delay and the coup d'etat to overthrow Allende. On the one hand, the high commands of the armed forces had opted for united action and decided not to be led by any two-bit adventurer. On the other hand, 
they wanted to wait for more favorable conditions, that is, for some legal pretexts and a more evident attrition of the UP government, so as to be able to rely on a social base favorable to the coup. In order to prepare for united action as the material conditions for the coup were developing, it was necessary for the highest-ranking Putschist group to contain and bring under their leadership the innumerable sections which wanted to launch into anarchist actions. As we shall show further, no less than six attempted coups came to public attention before the final successful one. The analysis of these attempts and the reports of the CIA itself and the proliferation of these groups confirm our thesis that the really decisive factor was the reactionary class nature of the high command and officers of the armed forces, and not their so-called staunch constitutionalist and professionalist spirit. This latter thesis is nothing but the continuation of the shameful and treacherous campaign waged by the CP leaders during the period of the Agenda government, the campaign to flatter and praise the armed forces so as to disarm the people against them. Even today, these leaders maintain the same position, and they present what happened as the work of a few traitorous generals who sought to divert the armed forces from their legalist and apolitical traditions. Their obvious aim is to refurbish the bankrupt policy of alliance with the CDP and to get the approval of the armed forces to go back to Chile and resume legal activities in Chile one day, and thus continue to deceive the people. The truth is that the Putschists began organizing against Allende as far back as 1964, when there was just a remote possibility that he might win the presidential elections. The Senate Commission headed by Church established, in its report, that on June 19, 1964, quote, the Chilean Defense Council, the organization responsible for coordinating the armed forces, went to President Alessandri to propose a coup d'etat if Allende won. This offer, end quote, the report continues, quote, was transmitted to the head of the CIA station, who told the Chilean Defense Council, through an intermediary, that the United States was absolutely opposed to a coup, end quote. The answer was only natural, since the U.S. had invested over $3 million to get Frey elected, and the surveys predicted that he would garner over 50% of the vote, which is what actually happened. But there's more to it. Quote, On July 20, end quote, says the report, quote, The deputy chief of the mission at the U.S. Embassy was approached by a Chilean Air Force general who threatened a coup if Allende won. The DCM reproached him for proposing a coup d'etat, and there was no further mention of it, end quote. Finally, the report stated, quote, The CIA knew in advance that the radical candidate for the election, several other Chileans, and some ex-politicians from another Latin American country, had met on June 2 to organize a rightist group called the Legion of Liberty. They said this group would stage a coup d'etat if Allende won, or if Frey won and set up a coalition government with the Communist Party. Two of the Chileans at the meeting reported that some military officers wanted to stage a coup d'etat before the election if the United States government would promise to support it. Those approaches were rebuffed by the CIA, end quote. Such are the constitutionalist and professionalist armed forces which the CP leaders and their supporters talk about. Concerning these above-mentioned officers of a coup d'etat, we must keep in mind that they were practically spontaneous and within the professional norms of the armed forces, since at that time, the far right, the CDP, and the U.S. government, certain that Frey would be elected, had absolutely no interest in promoting a coup d'etat. One can therefore imagine what the situation was in these same armed forces during the period of the Agenda government, while all these groups were striving to provoke a coup. Later, shortly before the 1970 presidential elections, the CIA started to prepare for the eventual necessity of a coup d'etat in Chile. Quote, in July 1969, end quote, the report of the Church Commission discloses, quote, the CIA stationed in Santiago requested and received headquarters approval for a covert program to establish intelligence agents in the Chilean armed forces for the purpose of guiding a coup d'etat. 
The program lasted for four years. It involved agents drawn from all three branches of the Chilean military, end quote. The report continued, quote, During August, September, and October 1979, it became increasingly clear from the agents' reports that the growing dissatisfaction and unrest within the armed forces was leading to an unstable situation. The events culminated in the abortive military revolt of 1969, the Tacnaso, named after the Tacna Regiment of Santiago. How close the amateurist Tacnaso came to success was a lesson to remember, particularly in the light of the upcoming presidential election of 1970 and the strong probability that Salvador Allende would emerge victorious, end quote. With this attempt, which only raised certain economic demands for the armed forces, demands which were met by the government, Theo began in actual fact to offer his services to the United States, who would need them in case Allende won. The report of the Church Commission goes on to describe the facilities that the CIA had for finding Chilean military groups willing to stage a coup, and, as we shall see later on, it was not the only one to seek out such groups. About the period which was to culminate with Vio's second attempt, which we have already described, the report writes, quote, Between October 5 and October 20, 1970, the CIA made 21 contacts with high-ranking army and carabinero officers in Chile. Those Chileans who were inclined to stage a coup were given assurances of strong support at the highest levels of the U.S. government, both before and after the coup. Further, the Senate report states, quote, By September 1971, a new network of agents was in place, and the station of the CIA was receiving almost daily reports of new putschist conspiracies, end quote. Toutless inspired by the constitutionalist spirit of the armed forces. The report then proceeds, quote, The station and headquarters began to explore ways to use this network, end quote. The report then reveals a fact which shows that the CIA had learned from its error of encouraging VO and had understood that it had to wait for the armed forces themselves to designate the leader of the coup and unite behind him. In October 1971, the CIA opted, quote, in favor of passing verifiable information to the leader of the Putschist group, which headquarters and the station perceived as having the highest probability of success, end quote. And further, quote, During 1972, the station continued to monitor the group which could mount a successful coup, and it spent a significantly greater amount of time and effort penetrating this group than it had on previous groups. This group had originally come to the station's attention in October 1971. By January 1972, the station had successfully penetrated it and was in contact through an intermediary with its leader, unquote. As we can see, the group with the highest probability of success did not come out of the blue as a result of a last-minute treason, as the supporters of the thesis on constitutionalist armed forces try to pretend, but it had already been detected among various other putschist groups in 1971. If the CIA had such success in finding putschist groups within the Chilean armed forces, it is easy to imagine what occurred there when we consider that the various opposition parties were also acting with the very same perspective about the Allende government. Even the tiny fascist group Patria y Libertad was able to provoke an attempt at a coup d'etat. The unsuccessful Tacnaso of June 29. But furthermore, with respect to the United States, by far the most influential stimulator of the putschists, one has to realize that it was not only the CIA which was involved. The report of the Senate Commission says, quote, Ambassador Kerry was authorized to encourage a military coup, provided Frey concurred in that solution. At the meeting of the 40 Committee on September 14, he and other appropriate members of the diplomatic mission were authorized to step up their contacts with the Chilean military officers to assess their willingness to support the Frey Gambit, end quote. The so-called Frey Gambit, in which Frey himself later refused to get compromised, consisted in his transferring power to a military junta under the pretext of averting a civil war. This junta would then call an election in which Frey himself would run, 
In order to organize the coup, the U.S. ambassador was even authorized to lie to the armed forces and threaten them that if Allende was inaugurated as president, all military aid and sales of arms would be stopped. To lend a semblance of credibility to his threat, quote, Kerry was authorized to inform the Chilean military that the whole MAP, military aid pact, and all military sales would be suspended pending the outcome of the congressional election on October 24, end quote. That is, until the Congress decides whether or not to name Agenda to the presidency. The threat of cutting supplies did not only fail to materialize, but on the contrary, these supplies increased significantly once Agenda took office, which shows how much the U.S. government trusted the putschists within the armed forces. Apart from the intervention of the U.S. ambassador to promote a coup, the Pentagon was also very active through the Defense Intelligence Agency, DIA. Despite the fact that this participation was zealously kept secret, even in the Senate report, because it compromised the U.S. armed forces in low-caliber putschist intrigues, there are many testimonies of the DIA's involvement in both the preparation and the execution of the coup d'etat. There are even some who think that the DIA played a more effective role than the CIA itself because of its extensive contacts with the Chilean military. It is undoubtedly to the DIA that the Senate report is referring in veiled fashion when it alludes in quotes to, quote, other appropriate members of the diplomatic mission, end quote. Who would be more appropriate than the U.S. military with their extensive and flexible contacts with the Chilean military? Concerning the participation, so secret and hidden, of the DIA in the coup, it is necessary to point out that under Frey's administration, tensions occurred between the Chilean and the U.S. executives because of a fact that caused a real scandal shortly before the presidential elections. Some 100 members of the U.S. Navy had entered the country by passing themselves off as the Naval Band of Operation Unitas, cancelled that year because of the Chilean elections. It was later discovered that these were no innocent musicians, but high-ranking officers. Significantly, later on, the date of the coup d'etat was chosen to coincide with the precise moment when the U.S. Navy was displaying a large number of ships in the Chilean territorial waters under the pretext of Operation Unitas. Besides, the Church Report cannot help but recognize that, quote, U.S. military attachés maintained contacts with the Chilean military for the purpose of collecting intelligence, end quote. It then comments, quote, whether these contacts encouraged the Chilean military to oppose Allende, or whether the Chilean military, already goaded towards a coup during Track 2, took encouragement to act against the president from those contacts, even though this was not the intention of the U.S. officers, this is one of the major questions surrounding the clandestine activities of the U.S. in the period of the Allende government, end quote. Most subtle considerations on the part of those who did not hesitate to invade the Dominican Republic, Vietnam, Cambodia, and so many other countries. It is obvious, however, that the DIA's intervention acquired particular importance after the failure of the first attempt to stage a coup d'etat through VO. That is, when it was stated that it would be awkward to try to divide the armed forces through contacts from below with the putschists and that only a command of the highest level would be able to discipline all the putschist groups and act effectively. However, even before Vio's failure, Thomas Karamessenes, the CIA Director of Operations and Chief Liaison Officer with the U.S. government, had already sought coordination with the DIA, as he said before the Senate Inquiry Commission. Quote, We also had to contact the broadest sections of the Chilean Armed Forces, especially the high-ranking officers, with whom we had no regular liaison, not having foreseen such a necessity. But we were sure that our military representatives in Chile knew them well. To make sure that this attaché would collaborate with our efforts to get information, we still needed the agreement of the DIA, end quote. This rather belated proposal for coordination between the two agencies does not mean that the DIA was not already active on its own, as were the embassy and the multinationals. The CIA then approached Jamie N. Philpott, assistant director of the DIA, who sent the following message on September 28, 1970, to the U.S. military attaché in Chile. 
quote, You should work in close coordination with the chief of the CIA, or, in his absence, with his assistant, and advise him as to the leading military figures who might play a decisive role in any movement that could eventually deny the presidency to Allende, end quote. The second part of the message shows how carefully the Pentagon's activity was covered up, to the extent that the U.S. Senate itself, as it seems, did not have the right to expose it. Quote, Do not inform the ambassador or the defense attaché of this message, and do not give them any clue about its content. In your routine activities, follow the instructions of the ambassador. At the same time, I want and I now order you to act in concert with the chief of the CIA. This message is for you only. You should not discuss it with anyone other than the CIA agents who will be recognizable. The CIA will identify them to you." Unquote. Typically, both Kissinger and Bennett, director of the DIA, and their depositions before the Senate Commission denied any knowledge of these arrangements which, nonetheless, appear in the declarations by the CIA officers before the same commission. The persistent denials by the U.S. ruling circles of the Pentagon's participation in the coup d'etat against Allende are just as ingenuous as the efforts of Senator Church to save Frey's reputation. The latter is the only Chilean politician referred to by name in the report, and every time the name comes up, it is said that he, quote, knew nothing about this operation, end quote, or, quote, he refused to participate in that operation, end quote, etc. This obviously proves the exact opposite. To complete the list of the anti-constitutionalist and reactionary putschist tendencies which fought to have their say within the Chilean armed forces, we have at our disposal not only the facts admitted by the CIA officers before the U.S. Senate, but also the account of the frustrated coup d'etat attempts that took place from the time Allende took office to the coup that overthrew him on September 11, 1973. If we include Vios, which we have already analyzed, we can count six attempted coup d'etat before September 11. And these are just the ones that were brought to public attention. How many were stifled right within the armed forces before even coming to light? In March 1972, Colonel Julio Canesa Roberts, from the Temuco Regiment, was caught organizing a network to sabotage agricultural production together with the landlords of the region. Later, he tried to confine his regiment to its barracks, at a time when it was to join the Valdivia and Osorno regiments. He had close connections with the fascist organization Patria y Libertad in the area, as well as with the Rolando Matus commando group from the National Party, and he provided all of them with paramilitary training and assisted them in smuggling weapons from Argentina. It was later discovered that these had links with General Alfredo Canales of the Santiago garrison. When he heard about these facts, Allende exposed them to General Prats, who, in consultation with the Junta, decided to transfer Canesa to the military school in Santiago to restrain his premature putschist urge. In September 1972, during a celebration in Viña del Mar, in which the high-ranking military leaders participated, General Alfredo Canales, quite drunk, started talking loosely and confidentially told Rear Admiral Horacio Justiniano that a coup was being prepared to overthrow Allende, about whom he spoke in abusive terms. Justiniano, who was not yet aware of this putschist maneuver, consulted with General Prats in the capital. Prats, for his part, consulted with the generals of the Santiago garrison, Canales included. Considering the danger represented by Canales' disloyalty, and the fact that the President of the Republic would probably be informed by Prats, the general agreed to retire Canales. At the same time, in order not to arouse the suspicion of the government, they decided to make the plot appear as if it had been discovered and denounced by the military intelligence service. Canales was known for his stubbornness, for which he had been given the nickname El Macho, and had already declared, quote, They can't throw me out that way. I am not Vio. I've got half the army behind me, end quote. The necessity to organize the coup d'etat in a hierarchic and constitutional manner prevailed. At that time, the CIA and the U.S. government had clearly understood this necessity, and Canales was retired. 
His putschist attempt was denounced by President Allende on September 14, 1972, as the September Plan. The putschist plan to be organized from the highest level included, however, a number of tactical measures to facilitate its execution. From the point of view of looking for a legal pretext, the plotters awaited the expiry of the constitutional delay during which the President of the Republic could call a referendum on the constitutional reform of the three sectors of the economy. Allende would then be at the mercy of the parliamentary opposition. This is what happened on June 6, 1973. Shortly after, on July 2, the Contraloria rejected the proposal of the government to enact on its own those articles of the reform which had not been vetoed by the executive. This was what the majority parliamentary opposition had been waiting for. It could now declare the illegality of the government for having violated the Constitution, thus providing the armed forces with the legal pretext they required. On July 2, the Christian Democratic Senator Juan Hamilton, a confidant of Frey, in politics as well as in unofficial affairs, declared, quote, the government had already violated the Constitution in not enacting the full amendments to the Constitution reform of the three sectors as soon as the Contraloria had rejected its intention of enacting it in partial form, end quote. The armed forces were also waiting for the upcoming truck driver's strike, which was to begin on July 25, in which the taxi drivers and other professionals were supposed to join. Furthermore, from the operational point of view, and by way of sounding out the possibility of popular resistance, they had planned to raid a number of factories, trade union offices, and working-class homes within the framework of the Arms Control Act, which had been approved by both the opposition and the government. Meanwhile, within the armed forces, a fierce repression was initiated against all those suspected of having sympathy for the government or even some scruples of a legalist or constitutionalist type. Finally, it had been planned to obtain Prat's resignation by means of a series of provocations. One of the officers involved in the coup declared to the New York Times on September 27, quote, We would have taken action even if Allende had called a referendum or had been able to reach a compromise with public opinion. Nothing could stop the coup after Prat's resignation. We were just putting the last touches on the plan, end quote. On the morning of June 26, the military plotters, together with the CIA and certain sections of the opposition, began open provocations against Prats. As the latter was going to his office, Virginia Cox, a virago of the ruling class, blocked his way with her car and started insulting him. Prats, thinking that the person was a man, intercepted her car and walked out of his own, revolver in hand. At this exact moment, a number of cars surrounded the general and groups of people mobilized for the provocation came out to abuse him. Prats had to flee in a passing taxi. His car was completely covered with slogans such as General Chicken, Prats the Queer. As if by some miracle, there happened to be a large number of journalists on the spot. The next day, Prats was portrayed as insulting and threatening a woman with his gun and trying to assault her. This was just the beginning of a campaign to force Prats to resign so that the coup could be led from the top level and without splitting the armed forces. These provocations finally achieved their purpose. On August 23, Prats handed his resignation to Allende following a demonstration held against him at the door of his home by a group of women, including wives of various armed forces officers. On August 22, Prats met with 22 generals to draft a resolution exonerating him. Only four generals accepted his demand, and 18 opposed it. Among those who had agreed to exonerate him was General Augusto Pinochet. However, before the conditions foreseen in the plans of the Putschist High Command could materialize, there was another military group, incited by the fascist organization Patria y Libertad which tried to hasten them. The day following the initial provocation against Prats, a general of the 2nd Armored Regiment was arrested for inciting his army men to rise against the government and the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. The next day, the commander of their unit, Lieutenant Colonel Roberto Super, was relieved of his duties. On the 29th, 
the armored regiment rebelled and sent six tanks to shell the Moneda and free their captain, who was held at the Ministry of Defense. Aware of the putschist activities which were developing throughout the armed forces, these military were trying to rush things and take the leadership of the putschist movement. However, the most important leaders of the coup d'etat, in close contact with the CIA, were waiting for various conditions to be met, such as those enumerated above, in order to ensure the success of the operation. The rebels were urged to surrender, and they did after they realized that no other unit had followed them. The leaders of Patria Libertad immediately sought asylum at the Embassy of Ecuador. President Allende had been informed, however, probably by Prats himself before his resignation, that the following generals were also involved in a plot to overthrow him. Bonilla, CDP supporter who was to die in an accident after the coup, Nuno, Baeza, Arellano, Javier Palacios, and Torres de la Cruz. It was on this occasion, which we have already described, that Allende was prepared to retire them and was opposed by the CP leadership, which he had consulted between August 21st and 23rd. On his part, Pinochet, the leader of this plot, did his utmost to convince the president that it was preferable to dismiss them after the formation of the Armed Forces Qualification Council, which was to meet in mid-September. Meanwhile, Allende and the UP leaders decided to set up a coordinating body between the United Workers Central and the Armed Forces, and to elaborate a plan to oppose any putschist attempt. The liaison officer between the Armed Forces, the Central, and the government was none other than Augusto Pinochet. But before the final coup, there was still another attempt, led this time by General César Ruiz Daniel commander-in-chief of the Air Force. Taking advantage of his close links with the United States, this general tried to advance the coup by a few days, so as to acquire a leading role among the plotters. Because of the extremely serious political crisis, President Allende had appointed a cabinet comprising the four commanders-in-chief of the three branches of the armed forces and the Carabineros. Ruiz wanted to use this fact in order to provoke an Air Force mutiny and unleash the coup. To this end, he resigned from his position as Minister of Public Works. Given the desire of the President to have the Commanders-in-Chief of the Armed Forces in his cabinet, this meant that Ruiz also had to resign as Commander-in-Chief of the Air Force. But he had made prior arrangements with the officers of the Air Force so that they would not accept his resignation as Commander and would use it as pretext to mutiny and drag the rest of the Armed Forces with them. On Saturday, August 18, Allende met with Prats, with the Commander-in-Chief of the Navy, Admiral Raúl Montero, and with the most senior Air Force General next to Ruiz Daniel, General Gustavo Ley, today a member of the military junta. Allende informed them of the plot prepared by Ruiz Daniel and brought evidence of his participation in Puch's plans as well as his links with the CIA. He then threatened to release all information publicly which would have been extremely damaging to the general plan for a coup d'etat. Right after this, he asked them that General Ruiz be dismissed and replaced by Gustavo Ley as commander of the Air Force. General Ruiz was thus forced to resign from his position in the Air Force. Nevertheless, he never gave up his intentions. While Ley had already been appointed to replace him, he went to the Channel 13 television program, Now Let's Improvise, and appeared on the air wearing his Air Force commander's uniform. I personally participated in this program, and when I got out, I met the journalist Frida Modak, director of the Information and Broadcasting Office of the Presidency of the Republic. At the request of President Allende, she had unsuccessfully tried to pass a message to me asking me to reveal that Ruiz Daniel was no longer commander of the Air Force. The officials of Channel 13, however, absolutely refused to let the message go through. Meanwhile, in the program, the fascist Jaime Guzman, leading member of Opus Dei and presently acting as ideologue and advisor to the military junta, was collaborating with Ruiz Daniel's provocation. Quote, We are facing the most serious event that ever occurred under the present administration. The President of the Republic, according to what you're saying, talking to Ruiz, 
puts as a condition for being commander-in-chief of any branch of the armed forces that the person be a minister in his cabinet, in a government which is highly politicized. In other words, Mr. Allende thinks that the armed forces are a sort of Praetorian guard of his own. Nothing like this ever happened before. I maintain that this is deception. I say so because if the president told you, Mr. General, that you had to give up the post of commander-in-chief if you no longer wanted to carry on as minister because he wanted to have all three commanders-in-chief in his cabinet, he was fooling you. But much more serious is the fact that the president could come to such considerations and demand that a commander-in-chief become part of his cabinet as a condition of retaining his position in the armed forces." End quote. The next day, the Air Force remained in its barracks and the Joint General Staff of the National Defense, already under the control of the leading Putschist group, sent emissaries to convince the members of the Air Force that they should stop and wait. Thus, because of his personal ambition, Ruiz Danyao missed the opportunity of becoming a member of the military junta, and since the coup, he has had to be satisfied with the position of rector in the University of Chile. Now that the high command of the armed forces was in the hands of the Putschists, and that their leader was in contact and full agreement with the CIA and the DIA, the only thing left was to wait for the most appropriate time. In other words, certain favorable conditions, which we briefly described above, had to be met before fixing the date of the coup d'etat. This date had to be advanced a few days in order to prevent Allende from pronouncing, on September 12, his intention to present the Parliament with the plans on which he had come to an agreement with the CDP, then led by Fuente Alba. If there was no majority to support them, President Allende was willing to enact the constitutional reforms approved by the opposition or call a referendum in case of disagreement. The leadership of the CP had sent him a letter in which it accepted such a referendum and gave him full powers to come to an agreement with the CDP, even at the cost of a practically unconditional surrender. Therefore, despite the extreme polarization brought about by the opposition and the U.S. government, the latter was faced with the danger of the, quote, Chilean predilection for political compromise, end quote, asserting itself. This is precisely what the Soviets wanted. The moment of the coup had been long awaited and actively prepared for. Pinochet, in an interview with a Reuters journalist on December 29, 1973, said, quote, Look, I have here a memorandum dated August 1972. Here's another one dated July, which says that it is possible to seize control of the nation. In 1972, in the vicinity of the capital, we started to train units for the fight against extremist groups, end quote. The CIA, for its part, reported that it had detected the most important putschist group in October 1971. It also said that in January 1972, a few months before the decision Pinochet talks about, this group had been penetrated and contacts had been established with its leaders. One of the tasks to carry out during this waiting period was to hold back the numerous and uncoordinated putschist groups stirred up by the greedy ambitions aroused by the CIA, the DIA, and the various opposition forces. This had to be done while keeping the high command of the coup under absolute secrecy. Another reason for this delay, and possibly the most important one, considering what happened since September 11, was the desire of the armed forces to ensure their autonomy vis-à-vis -vis the political parties, to establish direct contacts with the U.S. government, which would permit them to stay in power after the coup. This was fully consistent with the new line presented by Rockefeller to replace the Latin American political parties with the armed forces. Thus, the Putschist command used the opposition parties and made them believe that they would inherit the government after the coup, to install themselves in the government and force the parliamentarians to resign. In this sense, the decision of Allende to have the participation of the armed forces in the ministerial departments, public utility companies, and other sections of the state was skillfully used to train members of the armed forces for the future tasks of governing. The number of civilian advisors presently required is indeed very small. 
This is another reason why the Putschists cultivated the confidence of the UP government in their constitutionalist spirit and refused to precipitate a coup d'etat, which otherwise would have served only the civilian politicians. This organizational setup of the coup d'etat and the necessity to wait for certain objective conditions before taking over the government, and then actually governing without needing political tutelage, is what the ideologues of the government, including the advisor of Agende, Joan y Garces, mixed up or pretended to mix up with the so-called constitutionalist and purely professionalist spirit of the armed forces. During the period of the Agende government, Garces, we mention him because of the great confidence Allende had in his advice, became a party to the CP leader's public praise of the progressive and democratic spirit of the armed forces. In his analyses since the coup, he portrays the armed forces as above-class struggle, as highly legalist and professionalist spectators willing to support the government as long as it is capable of ensuring the good functioning of the economy and the institutions. Since this was not possible due to the aggressiveness of the opposition and the interference of the CIA, on top of which came the disagreements and the ultra-left trends within the popular unity, the armed forces, according to Garces, were dragged into intervention by some of their members. This was probably Allende's opinion as well toward the end of his government, when even the most naive politician could no longer ignore the existence of putschist movements within the armed forces. In a book published after the coup, for example, Garces writes, quote, This attitude of Allende, of separating politics and the armed forces, was not unilateral, but was shared by the army itself, which, as an institution over and above its internal rival groups, adopted during this period a professional role, which was clearly distinguishable from the centers of political decision-making within the state, end quote. In another instance, he claims, quote, to the extent that Allende succeeded in showing that his government and person meant the possibility of preserving social peace and the state political institutions, the professional armed apparatus supported him, and in the process, reduced to impotency those small groups which wanted to overthrow him, end quote. For Garces to continue to demonstrate such political naivete after all that has happened, not only before but also after September 11, is either to conceal some ulterior motives, like the CP leaders, who would like to depict the coup as being the work of a few traitors, quote, who diverted the army from its apolitical role, end quote, in the hope of being allowed to return to legal political activity in Chile, or else it is an attempt to conceal his wish to absolve himself of his responsibility for Allende's errors. Garces dares to say all these things after the testimony of the CIA itself, about the innumerable putschist groups operating within the army, after the coming to light of the many unsuccessful coup attempts, and after Garces himself had recognized that, quote, in a deliberate and systematic fashion, the Latin American military institutions have been indoctrinated to confront a so-called internal enemy, the anti-oligarchic or pro-socialist popular social organizations, who they fear will take up insurrectionary forms of struggle, end quote and Garces was posing as Allende's Marxist advisor. Today, he is trying to lend some coherence to the hodgepodge of reformist measures which he inspired by claiming, quote, The fact that the Putschist forces succeeded in September 1973 cannot obliterate the fact that for three years they went from failure to failure, end quote. In order to corroborate this brilliant assessment, he quotes the CIA which stated before the Senate Commission, quote, We were informed that it, the coup, was going to take place 30-odd times before it actually did, end quote. And Garces concludes, quote, Despite the wishes of the putschists, no matter how paradoxical it may seem at present, the obvious role of the armed forces during this period is to be the armed support for the policy of the UP, end quote. This boils down to saying, this man has unsuccessfully tried to steal my money 30 times, thus proving how disinterested and honest he is. What a brilliant conclusion. The reasoning of Garces could make a little bit of sense if there had existed in the armed forces a high command which was actually more constitutionalist than reactionary, as he and the government thought, 
and which had been subordinated and bypassed by lower-ranking officers with fewer legalist scruples. In fact, Garces claims, quote, It is among the latter, those of lower rank, that the putschist pressure took hold more readily, end quote. But, how paradoxical, after Prats was removed, it was the commanders-in-chief of the armed forces who led the coup with the support of almost the entire general staff. Even Garces himself cannot name more than three or four generals who abstained from the coup d'etat and prudently left the service when it was about to materialize for the sake of preserving the unity of the army. That is, of course, the putschist unity. Evidently, the necessity to suppress the wild and untimely putschist ambitions of the lower rank officers is transformed by Garces into a so-called anti-putschist spirit on the part of those who stopped them in order to prepare the coup in its most effective form. The CIA, as we have seen, only made a mistake in the initial stages, and was very quick to understand with whom it had to link itself. The political circles opposing the Agenda government were also absolutely convinced of the reactionary class nature of the armed forces and their high commands in particular. Only the government did not see this, or refused to see it. According to the ITT document examined by the U.S. Senate, Arturo Mate, the liaison between the armed forces and the multinational corporations, claimed right in September 1970, quote, The armed forces realize the great danger that Allende's accession to power represents for democracy. They agree that he must be stopped. However, the general staff of the armed forces and Frey would prefer a constitutional solution, that is, nomination of Alessandri by the Congress. This does not exclude violence, whether spontaneous or provoked, unquote. The CIA, despite Nixon's impatience, had also realized quite early that what the leaders of the armed forces wanted was just a legal pretext. On October 14, 1970, the CIA headquarters sent instructions to the Santiago station, pointing out, quote, it seems that the coup does not have a pretext or a justification sufficient to make it acceptable in Chile or in Latin America. Therefore, it seems that it is necessary to create one in order to back it up. You can include various themes that the military might use to justify the coup, unquote. The three-year delay in carrying out the coup was due, first and foremost, to fear in the face of the popular masses. Secondly, to the burning desire of the military to leave aside the political parties, and finally, to the division of the armed forces into various subversive factions, created, especially at the beginning, by the putschist pressures exerted by the U.S. government. The constitutional pretext, in any case, was in no way a crucial requirement, but merely a compensating factor required, in the beginning, for united action in the absence of sufficient conditions on other fronts. Intensification of the crisis, social movement against the government, etc. This is evidenced by the fact that the coup was unleashed without being motivated by a violation of the Constitution by the government, with highly questionable constitutionalist arguments. Furthermore, the date was advanced precisely at the moment when the high commands of the armed forces learned that Allende was ready to yield and fall into the legal traps which the opposition had set for him. For anyone not yet convinced of the arch-reactionary spirit and anti-constitutionalist mentality of the military leaders, it is enough to look at their conduct since the coup d'etat. What is left of the Constitution? What is left of the laws that existed in Chile? What remains of the institutions that were functioning before? Which political parties and trade union organizations can operate? What remains of the freedom of the press and other civil rights? Even the electoral lists have been burnt in order to avoid temptations. Before such irrefutable facts, which cannot be explained by a sudden change of mentality, the only thing that can be said is, God save us from such constitutionalist military forces.